right. Any more submissions for the homework assignment? All right, so a reminder about the project. You can go today and you can go Sunday. I don't think that the writing center is open during the weekend, are they? Has anyone been able to schedule an appointment on uh, Friday or Saturday? They're open Friday? Hmm. All right, so the deadline is by the end of the day on the 13th, so please have that done. Um, also, for the, uh, the next homework assignment, we're going to begin talking about solid waste management today, and we're also going to be covering it on uh, Sunday. I don't have the assignment ready to give to you yet. I'll post it this afternoon on iLearn. I'll bring paper copies on Sunday as well. Um, but uh, you can, if you want to get an early start on the assignment based on what we do for today's in-class exercise, then you can go on to iLearn and get the assignment later this afternoon. Finally, our last quiz of the semester will be on Thursday 17th, so that's a week from today, right before you go off for the winter break. So any questions about what's happening next week? No? All right. So today's class, we start talking about solid waste. And why do you think that solid waste is something civil engineers have to deal with? Yeah, how is, how, we closed the, the door out there, or the window. I opened it up to get some fresh air, but it may be noisy during the class. Thank you. Yes? Well, um, sludge solids are generated when we treat wastewater, but what we're talking about is actually garbage from people's house. Yeah, so that's what I mean by solid waste. So solid waste is going to include food scraps. It's going to include the paper that someone wants to throw away. Um, it includes uh, materials that are ultimately recycled. And so how is this an engineering issue? Any ideas about that? OK. Right, right. And so. That's a good point. Ultimately, where the waste goes is an engineered solution. And that's what we'll cover when we get together on, uh, on Sunday, is where the, landfill, or where the waste is uh, buried and ways that we can isolate it so it doesn't harm the environment. And the other part of it is uh, kind of historical in nature. You know, we're called civil engineers. And so the types of problems that civil engineers work on are the problems that face society. And whenever big groups of people gathered together, historically, uh, there would be big outbreaks of disease, and that was attributable to poor sanitation. And so it's partly about the, uh, you know, conveying the wastewater out of the population center to avoid disease. But then think about the sorts of things that can come if the garbage isn't also somehow reasonably and efficiently collected and disposed of. It can bring Pests like uh, rats, which bring disease. Uh, birds, of uh, carrion birds that also uh, carry disease. And just uh, the smell makes the uh, society have a decrease in the quality of life if solid waste isn't dealt with. And so, you know, historically, the civil engineers were the ones that solved the problems that faced societies when people gathered together in, in large amounts. And so that's part of the, another reason why civil engineers have to deal with it. Uh, and then the other aspect of it is that, in a lot of ways, solid waste collection is a traffic optimization problem. And you know, civil engineers do that, too, traffic. So This figure is from the text. And what it shows is the, uh, how much waste people generate. And it's expressed in terms of kilograms per capita day. And so it's the mass of solid waste that's generated per person per day. And <laughs> on this figure, there's the maximum and minimum, that's the, uh, the lines on the outside, and then shaded in gray is the usual range. Where do you think we are here in the UAE in terms of generating a low amount of solid waste per person versus generating a lot of solid waste per person? Yeah, think about how much packaging there is when you order food from outside the university. Like if you order something from Al-Shamayel and they bring you 
a normal food, it's coming wrapped in paper, probably not just one paper. If you order shawarma, it's like wrapped in three papers, and then it's in a plastic container, and then, then that's in a bag that's in another bag, and they also give you straws and napkins and ketchup, whether you want ketchup or not. So uh, some fries, no matter what you order, it's going to have some fries with it. Maybe that will contribute to solid waste if you throw away the cold fries. And so there's just so much extra waste that um, in the past when I've seen news items that are talking about the per capita solid waste generation, the UAE is on the high side. So is the United States where I'm from. We love to generate garbage. That's you know, the, the crowning achievement of capitalism is generating as much garbage as possible. So that's what we do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that's a huge step in the right direction, yeah. And the same thing is true here on campus where we have uh, two of the gray garbage cans, which is just for everything that shouldn't be recycled, and then one especially for plastic and paper and cardboard. Um, from what I understand, the one thing that doesn't get recycled here in the UAE is glass. And there's not a lot of benefit in recycling glass when you've got so much sand already because you know glass is mostly sand uh, and it's a very energy intensive process trying to melt down glass and so um, it doesn't have quite the same value of recycling things like metal and paper and plastics and so on. So this sort of a figure is what you can use if you're an engineer trying to figure out how many trucks we need to collect all of this garbage. I mean just think if you were dropped into a city that had no engineers uh, and you were assigned with managing the garbage problem. There are places where there are riots because of garbage, right? Where do they have riots because of garbage? Lebanon, Lebanon right? It, it's starting a big protest movement against the government because I don't know all the details. Huh? Anybody here have family in Lebanon? <laughs> yeah? And what stories have you heard about the, uh, the garbage? Anything? Is that what you talk about when you get on the phone is talk about the garbage? Really? Yeah. And when was that? This summer. This summer. Yeah. Um, what caused the, like, why did it start? Why, I mean, it wasn't always that way, right? What? what? It was better before. It, it was better in the past, so why is it bad now? What happened? There's no place to dump it here. Running out of landfill capacity? And every area, like, protesting, don't want to take it out. Yeah. Right. Nobody wants a landfill in their backyard. There's something that's called NIMBY. And this is a problem whether it comes to a landfill or a wastewater treatment plant or a prison. Everyone looks at something and they say, not in my backyard, right? Nobody wants to have incineration in their backyard or a landfill. And so, yeah, when, when there's political gridlock and people can't make the decision of where to take the waste, then it just sits uncollected. The same thing has been true in Italy. I think it was in Naples. There, there were garbage riots in Naples for the same reason. Just uh, the, the collection system broke down and people get angry really fast when the basic services of society aren't being satisfied. So it's a timely issue. So garbage, what is it? Uh, if you look at the breakdown of what's usually going to a landfill, or actually not what's going to a landfill, I guess what we should say is before recycling, so just what's coming out of people's homes. Hopefully what they'll do is sort through some of this paper and recycle it. Not every piece of paper is suitable for recycling. You know, the really slick, glossy paper that has color printing on it sometimes isn't as easy for recyclers to process as um, newsprint or paper like this. I, I shudder to think about how many landfills we've filled up this semester with all the paper that I've given you. Because every day you come, it's like four papers, right? Lots of paper. I feel guilty about that, but at least you're learning. Um, a lot of metals, and metals of all the things that can be recycled, metals has the highest rate of recovery. And that's because uh, there's value to it. In a lot of places, they've put a deposit and a reward system where, for example, to buy a, a can of soda, you pay for the soda and then also you have to pay a deposit on the can. Some places it's as high as, you know, what would be the equivalent of maybe uh, 50 fills that you're paying for a can or a bottle. 
and then it gets refunded to you. And most people won't bother to keep their cans and you know, take it for the refund, but then there's always, well not always, there's, there's people who like to recycle and so they go from place to place collecting all the, all the bottles and cans and uh, recycle them. So metals has a really high rate of recovery. It's increasingly coming the case for plastic and they're even starting to have some of those recycling deposits for some plastic bottles depending on where you live. Those are becoming more common in Europe and in North America. Uh, but there are some things that uh, can't be recycled as easily. If you think about yard trimmings, that's talking about the grass. Um, it can't just be recycled into new grass. And so what they're doing instead is trying to recover the nutrients that are in the yard trimmings. That has phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon. And so that can be combined with sludge solids and turned into a mulch that's very good for growing things. Uh, so it takes a little bit more effort, but you can combine it with food scraps and the sludge solids. And in the end, try and recover as much as possible rather than disposing of it. Because to dispose of it, as we'll see on Sunday, is very, very expensive, time-consuming process to find an isolated location that won't allow it to escape into the environment. There's actually technical definitions between, you know, you maybe sometimes hear trash, garbage, rubbish, and think maybe all of those words are interchangeable. And informally, we can use them in interchangeably, but actually there's a technical definition that differentiates between garbage, which includes food and biological material that can be degraded. This garbage is what can smell uh, if it's left for too long. Garbage is the stuff that is attractive to rodents and disease-carrying uh, vectors like uh, cockroaches, you know, the insects that would love to get into this organic matter. By contrast, trash is actually just paper, cardboard, plastic, and so it's not going to smell in the same way that garbage does. A trash is just uh, extra papers, and hopefully we can recycle as much as possible of this trash. In some places where they don't uh, recycle effectively, instead what they do is they try and convert waste into energy. And they do that by burning the waste. It's most common in, uh, in Europe, where they really have run out of room for landfills. There are some places in the United States that do waste to energy, usually in the northeastern part of the United States, like by New York and Boston, because that's where population densities are high, that's where people have been living the longest, and so there's not as much land. And so trash will have a lot of energy content because it's relatively dry compared to garbage, where the moisture content in garbage is going to be higher, that makes it more difficult to burn. Because you know, if you're burning it, you're also having to drive off the water. And uh, turning that water into water vapor requires a lot of the energy that otherwise could be converted into heat. Any questions so far? You tell your parents that we talked about garbage and trash today. They'll be really impressed. All right. Yard waste is that organic material, clippings, plants, and so on. Uh, sometimes it can be worked into a, a mixture of, um, uh, of like a recycled mulch, but uh, sometimes it's just allowed to stay in place and, uh, and self-fertilize along. Okay, rubbish, not that word isn't used very often, but what it's just referring to is the oversized objects that sometimes you'll see as you're driving along the road, someone put a couch by the dumpster because it's too big for them to lift it and put it into the dumpster. So rubbish is all of the things like television sets or you know, a, a, the kid's car that's plastic and you'd normally drive around. It's just the odds and ends that are difficult to handle and sometimes you have to uh, call for a special, pick, special pickup with that. Now all of these things should be separate from demolition waste. When a building is torn down to clear a lot to put in a new structure, uh, these things can be very damaging to a landfill. Rebar can puncture through the layer of clay and plastic that uh, is put in place to try and isolate these other kinds of waste. And so landfills that handle demolition waste are separate from landfills that handle household waste. And hopefully, as much as possible, demolition waste can be recycled. You know, there's still a lot of value in the reinforcing 
material. If it's a steel structure, then that scrap can be melted down. And even they're starting to talk about recycling elements of concrete as an aggregate. Uh, and then there are special categories of waste as well. If you think about the medical waste, uh, it has to be isolated and treated with a lot more care because it can be infectious. And uh, things like asbestos, this is a material that the very small particles of it can get into your lung and irritate the lung in a lot of the same way that PM 2.5 does. Asbestos was an insulating material. It, sometimes people have fireproof gloves. In the past, those fireproof gloves were made out of asbestos, and uh, it's really dangerous. And if a building has asbestos, they'll usually put a tent over it to try and remove it during the remediation. Yes, but that also is a description that would uh, be for fiberglass. And fiberglass and asbestos are two different things. So that, that yellow cotton candy stuff, sometimes it's harmless, and sometimes it could be asbestos. So don't eat it. It's not really cotton candy. All right. All right, so I mentioned earlier that uh, there's the historical aspect of why we civil engineers are in charge of garbage. But then there's also just uh, that we have the technical skills required to do the calculations for, for example, how many trucks do we need? And we're used to doing numerical calculations like, well, a truck can hold a certain volume of, uh, of material and doing time-based calculations of the speed of the truck, how many stops can it get to in a day. It's just, it, it, it's natural that engineers are going to be doing those sorts of calculations. And we'll do an example of one today. And then the other aspect of it is route planning. Uh, sometimes transportation engineers get uh, called in to do this. And what you'd want to do in trying to figure out for a neighborhood that's on a grid system is not only what's the shortest distance, but also where would be the shortest delay. And so signal timing and trying to coordinate what direction traffic flows in an easy way can be harnessed to try and find the most efficient route strategy because you've got a lot of costs. These trucks are very expensive because they compact the trash. Um, the, the hydraulic and pneumatic systems that go onto a truck like this can double or triple the cost compared to if it was just a, a truck that didn't try and compress the waste. But compressing the waste gives the added advantage that they can go to more stops along the way before they have to go to the landfill to, to uh, to dump everything out. OK, so this is the equation that we're going to be dealing with today. And uh, what it does is it tells us uh, how much solid waste a truck can carry, how much solid waste is going to be in the truck based on how much time it's out there in the field going from stop to stop. So this equation is going to look at if you've got a crew of people that are out doing their route of trying to pick up the garbage, uh, how much is going to be in the truck if we account for things like uh, how many hours per day they're working. That's what H is. N sub D is how many trips they're making from their collection route to where the landfill is. Now, you won't be surprised that if this is the neighborhood, this is where people live, the landfill isn't right next to the neighborhood. People don't like that. So they'll have to drive, sometimes from where they're collecting the trash, they'll have to drive 20, 30, 40 kilometers away, dump the garbage, and then come back to the route once they're empty to start collecting the garbage again. So into our equation of how much garbage is going to be in that truck, it's how many hours they're working, how many trips per day they're taking. We also have to account for things like the travel time between the neighborhood and where the landfill is. That's where X comes into play. It's the, the travel distance, and S is the speed that the truck is going as it's going from the neighborhood to the landfill. And by the way, you'll notice that we're doubling X because it's the one-way distance from the neighborhood to the landfill location. Um, there's also going to be delay, because when the, when the garbage truck is sitting, sitting in a traffic jam, that's reducing how much trash it can collect over the course of the day. So we take into account the delay, how much time it takes to unload as it's tipping and the garbage is coming out of the truck. We account for the unloading time. And then the crew, you know, those are people who have a work break. 
They maybe get two 30-minute breaks per day, something like that. So all of these factors, you can see it's minus, 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 minus. We start with how many hours per day they're working, and then we subtract out all of the distraction and delay that takes them off of the route. So in the end, what's inside this bracket is how many effective hours they're working, and then the first part of the equation is looking at the, uh, the volume that they're collecting at each stop. So every time they stop in front of somebody's house, they're collecting uh, one can, two cans maybe, dumping it into the truck, and going to the next house. So we need to know the volume that they're actually collecting, and then consider how compressed that waste is. All right, so does everyone have a copy of today's in-class exercise? All right, I tried to make it a step-by-step -step process because this equation has lots of variables, right? So I'd like you to read through the problem statement to begin with. And uh, the first part on part one, fill in the blank to try and find out the, uh, the variable quantity, translate from the provided data to what we're going to put into the equations. One thing I'll note, be very careful with your units. Because sometimes I'm expressing delay, for example, in minutes. But double check to see if it wants delay in minutes, which it doesn't, or hours, which is what you need. So where it, uh, where it applies, you may, may need to um, change the units there. So what we're working towards in the end is figuring out two things. We're going to try and figure out... Um, how much is in the truck each time it goes to the landfill, and then uh, how many houses it has collected garbage from each time it goes to the landfill. So it can tell us the capacity of the truck. And if you knew how many households there were in a town, then that would tell you how many trucks you should buy. One last thing I'll mention before I turn you loose on this problem is this figure. Let's take a look at this figure. It is from a study that was done in the 50s. There was someone who did their research on how fast garbage trucks can move, right? Imagine doing that for your master's thesis. The speed of garbage trucks down the highway. <laughs> All right, that's what they did. They looked at basically how far away it is from the neighborhood to the landfill. And this curve is a relationship that expresses the total hauling distance, meaning the round trip distance, and then the speed. Because the further away it is, the more likely it is that you're taking a high-speed highway. But if it's a short distance, then probably more of your time will be spent on secondary roads or even primary roads where the speed limits are lower. Okay. So that's what you should use this figure for. That said, why don't you go ahead and get started on this one, and I'll be circulating around to double check your answers as you work on things. Let's pause for just a moment and make sure we're understanding all the variables correctly. All right. All right, so filling this in. Some people have asked about H, the working hours. Uh, leave it as eight hours per day because we're going to subtract out the break separately. Down here at the bottom, you can see that B is 0.5 hours. And the reason why is that the number of trips they take might be changing. Sometimes it could be two trips per day. It could be three trips per day. And so we need to find out um, per trip how many working hours there are versus how many break hours are allocated on a per trip basis. So if you look later on at the formula we're using, um, we should keep H as just the normal working hours per day. And then let's see. The other thing that's come up is talking about the distances, X. So X is the one-way distance from the neighborhood to the landfill. And in the formula, we're going to use 2X, meaning the round-trip distance, and then divide it by the speed. And so if we go to the figure here, 2 times the trip distance is 12.8, right? So it should be a little bit to the right of the middle. And I didn't do a good job of that. It looks like I'm a little bit to the left of the middle. I should have moved my curve a little bit further right. And we go up and to the left 
So maybe 26 or 27 kilometers per hour is going to be their average speed if they have to go that round trip distance of 12.8 kilometers. By the way, this part of the curve, that's just if it's more than 40. So they're trying to show a really long scale. This part of it had sort of a curve to it. So if they showed the whole thing all at once, it would be difficult to distinguish this aspect. So it's like they zoomed in on the uh, 0 to 40, and then they zoomed out to show 30, 40, 50, because the curve linearizes. All right. That's it for my interruption. So continue working. And uh, for part two, I think a lot of people are figuring that out. It use the uncompacted density, because part two is basically saying when they stop at each house, how much is going into the truck before the truck presses it down and, and reduces the volume. So it's going to be based on the 12, kilometer, uh, the 12 kilograms that they're picking up. That's the mass. And then the uncompressed density. All right, let's look at these calculations. I think most people are starting to finish up. OK, so the, the, the volume of the waste before it's smashed, the uh, uncompacted volume will be 0.11 cubic meters. Calculate the compaction ratio. That machine can keep pressing it down until it uh, has achieved a density of 400 kilograms per cubic meter. And, uh, and actually, at the landfill, they can achieve compactions much higher than that. They'll drive over the garbage with extremely heavy tractors, and uh, it really squishes it down. So here in, in part four, it turns out that uh, the truck, every time it goes to the landfill, is going to have 3.5 cubic meters. Okay, one thing that we'd need to double check is, is the truck they're planning to purchase, does it have a volume equal to or greater than that? Because if, if the truck itself only has a capacity of 3 cubic meters, we have to change all of our calculations. Because it, was, it would now have to start making three trips per day instead of two trips per day. And so think about all that extra travel time would be cutting into the amount of uh, hours per day it's actually collecting the, the garbage. And so uh, eight hours maybe wouldn't be enough time. So you have, as an engineer, have to sort of balance the efficiency of what's going to cost more, a large capacity truck or having the crew out on the job for a greater number of working hours per day. So that's one of the real world checks that we'd want to do is compare the volume that should be in, truck, in the truck to its capacity. The next thing is um, when we do these calculations, we find out that uh, it works out to about 117 pickups per load. Now that's going to vary depending on what you read for the figure. You know, maybe your pencil is a little bit wider than mine and so on. So some people have 120, some people have 115. But look at, in the problem statement, it says that we've got 250 locations per day. So that means that the truck, in the, in the town, regardless of the size of the truck or how many stops one truck can make, we know that there's um, 250 households that have to have a pickup each day. So how many trucks do we need? Yeah, two trucks isn't enough. We need three trucks to get all of them. But it's so close though, right? So double this, two trucks would get you to about 235 houses per day. So maybe it's better just to pay them a little bit of overtime and tell them to work eight and a half hours per day instead of buying a whole new truck just for a few extra stops. Because if you have that third truck, then they're not even going to be working an eight hour work day. So it's kind of an iterative process thinking about what are the expenses going to be for collecting the waste? And uh, not only how much, how big does the truck need to be, but how many of the trucks are required for the uh, 250 locations per day that need service. All right. Let's take one look at the, one last look at the announcements. I'll post the homework assignment online today if you want to get started over the weekend. Otherwise, I'll bring paper copies on Sunday. Please remember on your way out to put the in-class exercise onto the chair. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you on Sunday.